Welcome to a new episode of the SPE podcast, the place where we share interesting stories of interesting people. My name is Louis Morgner, and today I'm joined by Dominic Marr, who is a professor at SPE in Digital Innovation and Marketing and also the head of the Department in Marketing and Supply Chain Management. The areas of his research are best described by the human side of digitalization, but Dominic is also experienced in many uh, topics around strategic services, also design thinking and also marketing. Um, but today we have a very interesting topic that we're going to investigate. Quite simply put, it's a question, will robots take over the world? But to put it a bit more precisely, we're first going to talk a bit about the evolution of robotics over the past decade and also the new enabling technologies. Then we're going to have a quick look at the status quo and what is actually happening today in our everyday lives. And lastly, also, we're going to, of course, talk about the implications for us as humans. With this in mind, and without further ado, I would like to thank you, Dominic, for joining today, and I'm excited for our conversation. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about the topic, so thanks so much for the invite. Cool. Glad you, you came here. So let's get actually started with a bit also about background with you as a person and also your journey. Uh, today you're head of the department uh, for marketing and uh, supply chain management, as mentioned earlier. But what was your journey like uh, until this day a bit? What were your early days? Uh, my journey, um, my early days, I mean, so, so maybe the early days I, I start when, when also leaving... Um, Actually, what I did is um, I left um, um, academia, as a matter of fact. So now I'm back into academia. But I'm, I, I did my master in um, in Germany and in, in Sweden and Poland. And then I was happy actually to leave um, academia or the university world. So I left and went to industry. And I actually never thought that I would come back to academia. So it's actually a surprise, or to some extent a surprise that we meet here. I was happy to leave for practice. I was working in the automotive industry quite a bit, especially for European operations of, of uh, Volkswagen Group. Um, and um, at some point, um, I also thought also for private reasons, I mean, I moved to, to Belgium, I mean, to Brussels. And then I thought, like, um, I actually wanted to work actually for Toyota, which was, I mean, uh, uh, the, well, still has a European headquarters there. But they didn't have a job for me. So um, I looked a little bit around. And somehow by accident, coincidence, I found um, um, a person in Antwerp that would be then my doctoral mother, so to say. So she was actually supervising me. So I went a little bit by accident or coincidence into the PhD. And that is um, where my academic journey started. So yeah, it's maybe t taking a, a certain turn at a certain moment in one or the other direction. Um, and that makes uh, the person that, that I am in here also. I think always great to also see how some coincidences in life uh, maybe eventually lead to the best outcomes and also to the greatest yeah. uh, careers in, in the end. Absolutely. For me, it's actually probably the best that could have happened. I mean, uh, so, but I didn't know that that time, right? I mean, uh, so um, especially if you, after a couple of years, you know, uh, you work and then you feel like, oh, my, I established myself a little bit now after a couple of years. I know the people around me in, in, in my company and then the clients are right, the different companies. I felt really comfortable. And then you start again totally from, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But um, it was a beginning maybe hard, but I, it, it was a very good decision. And even now, I mean, I always have this practice side uh, in, my, uh, in my work. So I'm also working one day a week. I'm working for um, the Service Science Factory, which is much more focused on working with um, industry partners, working with the outside world, rather than being focused on the um, head of department or my own research and education. So I keep that. I mean, you somehow each stop that you have um, stays a little bit with you. I mean, uh, an experience, maybe a good one or bad one, but it stays with you. And that's, I think, how you build up this this person that you at some point are. That's how it feels. Uh -huh. That's a great way, I think, to think about life in general. Yeah. There's two things I'm actually curious about. The first one, very related to your, also your job as a head of the department. Yeah. What does a day of a head of department look like here at SPE? So what does a typical day for you yeah. look like? Is there something like that? A typical day? No. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, uh, I think you almost uh, um, wanted that answer, that there is no typical day. But uh, it has a lot to do with, um, so my calendar is extremely filled with meetings so you talk um, a lot 
I mean, I talk a lot with people in individuals, small groups. So, for instance, just about with a, with a, you meet with a person because he, he or she wants to develop her career. I and mean, then think about what is my next step? Um, and then you help the person to facilitate. Maybe you should um, look into this funding option. Maybe it would be good to do this uh, project or something. You talk a lot with, with groups inside the department, but then also represent it outside. So ultimately, it's full with meetings, as a matter of fact. And um, that... Um, That looks terrible, also, especially if you have to find a meeting space. But that is what it is, especially in an academic world, which is a little bit different, I think, to the practical, uh, or the, the, let's say, outside academic institutions. Keep in mind that the people work here, and including myself, um, the main reason why people work here, especially the researchers, is because they cherish their, their independence. They cherish um, that they are so flexible in their work life. So there's not a lot of top-down, um, let's say, command and control. No, that, is, that doesn't exist. So how you intrinsically make the people intrinsically motivated because they are, they are passionate about what they do. But how do you help them with their passion to channel that also in the right direction? Um, and that's what I'm doing all the time. And since um, you don't have a lot of command and control structure, um, you talk a lot to the people. And that is, um, I actually have to admit, I enjoy that the most actually also in my job as a head of department that sounds very fulfilling and yeah. also exciting i think you touched upon one point that i'm also very curious about which is intrinsic motivation but also mm. to a sense maybe purpose you could call it even yeah. what do you do you have a purpose what makes you get up in the morning to put it maybe a bit more precisely is there like a tr intrinsic driver for you personally Uh, it's, I'm in that sense extrinsically starting my day because it is definitely I mean the the the, the clock that makes it a, at least during the weekend um, um, professionally um, first of all we have to um, or I in a lucky situation also to um, combine that with my family life I mean so there's a sense of duty so I need to get up I mean I cannot stay I mean I have uh, uh, three small uh, small kids and that is also something that is really important also you have this combination of here in a family friendly environment so I think that is an important element at work what I um, what I find enjoying it's, it's similar to, to what I said I enjoy actually working with the people and, and it, you, if once you think like okay I, I somehow understand it I understand this per there's a pattern in how what people want then you have the next conversation and they just prove you're wrong because um, they have a very different way of, of what, they, what they would like to do what they would like in their career what are also personal uh, maybe uh, uh, issues what drives them and um, so that everybody's individual. I mean, I go with a smile to work and then uh, I look at the people around me, seeing them like today. I mean, it's not only sunny weather out there, but it is also, it's, it's, I see the people and everybody's individual and that is actually really cool. Uh, and it makes me, it makes me um, doing this job that I do also with, it makes it fulfilling. You're right. And, um, And I always have a bit in mind, there was this um, uh, former dean of us, I mean, said, I mean, who are you as a person? And he referred to his job as a dean. Um, somebody told him, you might be like James Bond. I mean, eh? um, and then he said, no, it's actually different. And I um, do the same. It is not about that you are as a department and you're not never, never James Bond. You are M. Right, I mean, uh, you have the people out there around you. These are the the super agents, uh, super smart people, and you are only there to facilitate to make sure that they have a fulfilling life. That makes you fulfilling, and that is actually um, the the switch that you have to have make also as a department head. And I I, I, I like it. I think also a great lesson in leadership, maybe in there, yeah. um, enabling other people's greatest contribution. Maybe that's even your real job as leader. So a yeah. uh, very interesting take on that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. So Dominic, let's actually stick with work a bit more because one <laughs> uh, part of also your day, also your professional work is also concerned with robotics in general. Yeah. And today we want to talk a bit about that. And I would suggest that we also start to understand the evolution of robotics over the past mm -hmm. years or even decade uh, a bit better. But even before we get started with that, I think we perhaps should define a bit what is robotics in the first place? What's the difference between a machine and a robot? Yeah, that's a, that's a 
you're starting really big. I mean, uh, because that's ultimately the big, 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 okay. big question. Yeah. Good point. I mean, uh, no, it is a, a super relevant question, and yeah. and it is also very much blurring. I mean, uh, what is a robot and what is not? I mean, uh, I brought. I mean, two examples. Also, one is a companion robot that we have been working with Vector, that is a smart one, um, and that is a, a dog, which is essentially almost a toy like. I mean, uh, so where does a robot start? Is it uh, the one that is perfectly human? Or is it the one that's selling in a factory? So if you want to make it very simple, um, a robot is essentially something that takes over a, a specific task, um, is um, driven by um, a machine and takes somewhat autonomous decisions. Yeah? So it takes, I mean, certain decisions by itself. And that's uh, the ultimate idea, what is a, a robot. What we are a bit more focusing on are specific robots. Is we are focusing on robots that are not, uh, that are real, that means physical. That means they have a physical body. Yeah? So they can lift an arm. So that, that's very different to, let's say, a holographic one. They're also holographic robots. So that's one dimension. I mean, how robots also uh, differ. The second dimension is um, the component of um, learning. To what extent are they able to learn? This one is connected with a lot of other robots, basically in, in a cloud, and has an AI-enabled learning mechanism. So what I teach this one robot, all the others are learning. Yeah, so that's the second element of, of learning. So it's this AI element, which is really important. And the last one that I'm particularly interested in is also this, uh, to some extent, um, human-like um, features. That means they could look like, let them look like we, or they look very different. I mean, eh? so they look like, okay, this is not a human, but uh, this is a, um, so in this case, it's a dog. But um, to what extent do they resemble real um, people? Or to what extent do they, um, or real feature, uh, f uh, creatures, um, or to what extent are they very different, looking more like machines? Um, and to what extent are they able to, for instance, um, take show empathy? I mean, uh, can they talk with you? Can they um, have a human interface? Can they have a conversation with you? Um, can you normally, almost like a human, interact with them? And that's uh, the third feature, I think, that I would say. So how physical are they? Um, uh, how much are they learning? And how human-like-ish or real-like-ish, what we expect, are they? And I think that is where I focus a little bit on. That's how you could categorize them. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds very modern and crazy, even if you think about those scientific, yeah. not, uh, like sci-fi yeah. movies in the yeah, past, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you saw those early yeah, ideas yeah. of how robotics could evolve over the next yeah. years. I think today, if we will look at reality, it's quite crazy how far they've come. What are the big enablers in, in that development, also in terms of technologies? You mentioned, for example, artificial intelligence yeah. or also reinforcement learning, perhaps, as more yeah. a specific example. Yeah. Like, yeah. well, what are the big enabling technologies for that progress? Yeah. Um, indeed, um, I mean, they, they, I think the, there are a number of technologies, and you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, so um, I think the technology each have advanced. Also, the one on, um, on um, how um, very haptics, for instance, mm -hmm. but also speech. I mean, uh, you have an, um, and you have these these technologies all divided. Think about an, an Amazon Alexa, right? I mean, uh, which is now very strong actually for for uh, a conversation, for instance. So this has evolved, for instance, the speech, I mean, uh, the haptics. I mean, doing this as a hand, is as, as a human, which you basically move your hand. It's extremely difficult to um, uh, replicate. Um, Connecting that with your brain is even more difficult. But now we're getting more and more, and you might have seen also some of the examples where, you, uh, where, where robots are jumping around, stairs up and down, dancing, moving, um, standing up, uh, etc., moving difficult uh, staircases up. Right, eh? And you see that a lot has evolved. So ultimately, the biggest enabler is not one, but it's a connection of those different technologies Together with, I think, this topic of um, how to design it for human tasks. Yeah? Um, because you can make a, a wonderful robot, but if you just um, take an engineering perspective, it might work. But if the people are not using it in a restaurant, in a, um, in a, in a hospital, um, then this is not uh, useful. And also considering... Um, ethical dimensions, moral dimension, where is it good, where not. So I think if you combine those, I mean, this is, this is almost the engineering perspective, the, the, the computer science perspective, um, the user-centric uh, design perspective, and the ethical dimensions, all of them have evolved and have connected. And that makes a big difference to it. And uh, uh, so, yeah, that's how I would see as an A+, as a connection between those different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's very interesting also to see how I think the different technological fields try to mimic some human capabilities as yeah. our senses, right? Sight, yeah. speech recognition, yeah. speaking, like yeah, text yeah. to speech or yeah. even the haptics as you mentioned. And yeah, bringing this all together, I think with the advancements in also machine learning is, is just wonderful to see in terms of technology evolving. Yeah. Uh, what you mentioned, I think that also resonated with me was that innovation needs to be rooted in needs, right? Mm -hmm. And a real problem, just innovating mm -hmm. for the sake of innovating is perhaps really a good idea. Yeah. So today in the world, you mentioned there's some different use cases for, for yeah. robots. So could you just uh, expand on those a bit? Like what, what can we currently yeah. do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, plenty. And, and indeed, I, I do think it's a point. I mean, we, we switched from a technology perspective to the user need perspective. Um, and um, think about... Um, uh, a restaurant. I mean, uh, and I don't know if you know that. I mean, so there's this. Uh, uh, it's called Dadavan, mm -hmm. which is one of our partners for because we founded uh, the Maastricht Center of uh, Robotics also, and we work together. It's a restaurant. It's a actually restaurant chain. They have one restaurant here in Maastricht also, where they um, employ different robots to serve customers. So the initial need was actually um, think about the pandemic also to keep the distance. Yeah? And that is, of course, helpful. I mean, to keep the distance. So there are um, robots employed uh, also in, in banks, which actually say, hey, you have to be one and a half meters away. God bless. Um, that was at some point not uh, that necessary anymore. Um, but we, what do we have? In hospitality, we have a shortage of labor. So people don't want to maybe work in a, in a restaurant. Um, so... The question is, in which way can be a robot part of your team? Yeah. So it's about shortage of labor, but it's also in particular about maybe a restaurant. It's, it's extremely hot food that has to be brought. It also is picking up the dishes. So uh, uh, it is shortage of labor and especially also helping the people that want to then or that work in that restaurant um, if there's less capacity to focus on the task, which are the most benefit the most from the human um, element and having a chat with you, I mean, on the table, um, taking the order, welcoming you, uh, telling a joke. Um, that is a different task than taking away the dishes or just bringing it. Um, or, um, yeah. But that is where you see the combination out of it. So there's, a, on the one hand, a need. But then even if there's a need, you f see where um, people don't want to take over maybe certain tasks or could be easily, um, would not like to do it or could be easily replaced, so to say. And that is how it works. I think that is uh, uh, the need, um, for instance, in a restaurant. Funny thing about that, Avan, I've actually been many times and the yeah. interesting implication perhaps on the yeah. marketing side yeah. is some people I think just go there for the sake of seeing a robot actually delivering orders, right? So That's it's true. a very funny connection also yeah, between, yeah. you know, actually being useful but also having implications on the marketing side of things. Absolutely. And we work with them quite a bit together and so we have to analyze that also and observe the people taking selfies and then mm. posting. And of course, in that sense, that is not only in, is a different need, but it yeah. also is um, um, a part of their communication strategy and interestingly they're evolving quite a bit with restaurants all over um, uh, the Netherlands and um, then also always integrating the robot in one or the other way you know? um, it's exciting <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely uh, one thing I was uh, actually wondering about is you mentioned the shortage of labor especially yeah. in the like restaurant area yeah. hospitality business um, at a certain point, cost also becomes a concern for restaurants, right? And I would imagine the moment that robots become cheaper to operate than humans, we would see a large-scale adoption of that economically because it becomes yeah. feasible for, for a lot of small small restaurants, for yeah. instance. Where are robotics at the current uh, state? Are, are they cheaper than human labor? Are we far away from that? Where, where, where do we live currently on that spectrum? Mm. Or is that too difficult to say, perhaps? I, I don't know. Um, they are already... And, and I'm making a bold statement, and um, but um, they are already cheaper, but they cannot do as many tasks as we want to, right? So if you think about um, the robot, I mean, uh, in a, a Dalavan, I mean, uh, it is, uh, it might be struggling to. Um, there's a stair in in, in uh, actually it's on two levels, but the restaurant. I mean, so there's a staircase or something. It, it it struggles. I mean, to get up. I mean, on that staircase on the higher level. So you need to facilitate that, for instance. Yeah. So um, because the robot itself is not that extremely expensive, but they do a certain task. 
So there's not an all-purpose robot that said that can do it all. You know, it can walk the stairs and can to talk you, tell you jokes and can serve you and and and. It's for a particular um, task, and that's in that sense it is a, that is affordable for a particular task. But it's less um, that you, um, you to some extent, have to, for instance, redesign your restaurant in this case, or be it an elderly care center, or be it a retail, a supermarket, or whatever you, wherever you want to use it, to accommodate also the needs of a robot. And um, that is something that we have to be in mind. Maybe we have to design robots not for humans, I mean, uh, but actually for the for the for the robots. Um, and there's quite some examples and um, I think very strong cases where also maybe I've seen that in the, at the Olympics also um, because there are a lot of um, restaurants were actually um, serving through some kind of automated systems. Yeah? But that means there was nobody serving that anymore. But um, um, the restaurants were actually robotics and, uh, units And around them, you put a, put a building, almost like that. Eh? So um, I don't think we want to live in that in the future, but they did that, of course, to avoid all kind of uh, corona infection, etc. Um, but um, you have that already on a massive scale that you actually design around the machine rather than around the, the human. Good or not, but it's something where we are right now. Also, I guess, a very interesting question for the future and how... how yeah things will develop from here onwards. Yeah. So we talked about one um, field of application for, yeah. for robotics, but I could imagine there's also other ones out there sure. that are very relevant. Are there some that you can also mention and share a bit? Yeah, I, I think everywhere where you... Um, uh, hospital, uh, sorry, in a hospital or an elderly mm -hmm. care center. So imagine, I mean, people that want to live by themselves important is for us really independent living. Um, that's one of the imp most important um, drivers of people um, to also stay healthy and they, they want to live by themselves. But let's be honest, um, people are afraid to fall. People forget their medicine if they're from a certain age. Maybe they have a certain, uh, um, uh, also they need certain protection because they have maybe dementia or so they cannot, I need to make sure that they're not um, running out of a house, etc. Um, so what you could have, you could have somebody um, who is taking care, a formal caregiver taking care all the time, or informal caregivers or family and friends. That's one I, uh, But you could also have a robot that lives with that person, that reminds you of the medicine, that actually reminds you also of, and maybe shows you a game and also helps you with their doing exercises, etc. So this is an element which is... Um, um, where, where we are actually working quite a bit also with different types of hospitals um, or different types of elderly care centers and that is a very strong business case because um, the robots are not crazily expensive um, but um, um, it is very expensive for instance to have an informal, informal caregiver so the costs are actually quite low but of course an issue that you have is what about the adoption? Does the elderly person want to have it? Do I, as a as a family member, want that my father or mother is served by this metal box or something? And of course, the doctor and the nurse also might potentially have concerns are very relevant. So in this um, uh, element and this complexity where the business case is easy, so to say, but uh, the actual making it happen is very difficult. And this is um, what I enjoy actually doing also. And that is, um, that is one of the, the other, um, let's say, use cases. But there are several others in where you have to uh, do security services, where you're in a retail center, give a support, where you um, give guidance. So there are plenty of others. And I'm focusing a bit now on the, on the service robots, so robots that deal with humans, mm -hmm. which is very different than robots that, that uh, we, we say it's in an unstructured environment. It's different if you talk about industrial robots that don't have to deal with humans, um, but you have that for a long time already. The entire automation of factories in the automotive industry is, is actually a uh, It's quite old in that sense. But we are most interested in how do humans and robots interact because that's a difficult one because the human is not fully predictable, but it's also much more flexible. Uh -huh. One thought that 
was just triggered while you were speaking is actually one I think quite famous example also in the press and I think mm -hmm. it's of Google they have a project called the Everyday Robots mm -hmm. um, and I think they're actually working on well their claim to fame I would say is robots learn to understand us it's really about this general purpose they can learn and they I think also um, used reinforcement learning mm -hmm. quite heavily to actually train those robots without yeah. any external input and they can really learn on their own so you kind yeah. of tell those robots for example learn to pick up a a cup yeah. and put it into the right bin uh, yeah, in, 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 the, in the trash, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's still very early and just doing it in a lab setting for now, but of course their mission one yeah. day is to actually have everyday robots in every place, I would say. Yeah. How far out, even though I know it's probably a very mm. complicated question and predictions are the hardest thing ever to do, yeah, yeah, but yeah. still we talk about specific use cases today um, on the one side of the continuum and on the other side about general purpose robots. Mm. How far do you think are we to actually have those kind of robots in our houses, in our universities, in our restaurants? Um, general purpose um, robots, I'm more doubtful. Special purpose ones, I don't see the reason why it should take longer than five, ten years. Um, It's, it's, it's up to you. I mean, it's up to us. I mean, uh, what activities you don't want to do? Do you want to bring your um, laundry to the, um, I don't know, the, 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 the place where you have to do your laundry if it's not, let's say, in your house or in your flat, for instance? Uh, do you want to pick up your groceries? Um, so I think there are quite some which you can do. Do you, um, I don't know, I'm not a big fan of doing my, uh, let's say, the dishes my, uh, myself. So if I can avoid that, um, but even picking it up, maybe cleaning the table, if then. Um, so the question is more also, um, are they able to do so? And what is the specific purpose in which we are? But Every day, look about, the, uh, look about the, uh, the activities that you don't like to do. And, and then we see, can we add a robot to that? And then it's a matter of um, to what extent um, can we adapt maybe also you? Can, will you be able to adapt in order to be, make the robot ready. Think about, I mean, the, the table. So, yes, you sit there in the morning, you have breakfast, um, and then um, you leave everything there. So the robot might have a difficulty to, to reach, let's say, your table. But if you say, um, I, have, um, I give it on a special tray, and then the robot can do everything, then you adapt a little bit, and the robot is able to um, do so. And that is, can happen then much quicker, let's say, in five, ten years. I think that's a realistic time that uh, people might have their, their robots that actually serve them in such a way. Why not? Uh, I think one central topic we cannot get around when talking about those kind of things is just in general the human-robot interaction. Mm -hmm. right? And how also humans react to right. robots yeah, yeah, in yeah, a so, restaurant. So, and I think yeah. you teased that already yeah. a bit yeah. also from the work you do with, for example, uh, Dadawan here yeah. locally in, in Maastricht. So kind of what, what does the research say? What, what, do you, what do you think about that? And it's a good, uh, good question because at Dadawan there is um, there actually two types of robot. One that looks like a shellfish, like I mean, it looks like a, almost like a, a running uh, shell with eyes and and, uh, and the other one looks almost um, humanoid right I mean human like I know and um, it is uh, quite interesting to see the different uh, reactions of people and uh, ultimately it is that people prefer to have something that looks more like a human I mean uh, to be more willing to work with them do something with them but there is a, a maximum of what they uh, see so, so it goes up at all, uh, but at some point the people say oh my god this is too Uh, human, the Tesla example, I think, but also other robots is there, um, which um, are too humanoid. And then people say, "Oh, this is creepy." I mean, eh? and and then, then they say, then, then become very hesitant and um, develop a reluctance, a resistance against the robots. Yeah? So it is very interesting to see that. I mean, to um, maybe we have to, and that is something. Um, in which way are we indicating that we are dealing here with a robot? And right now it seems still very obvious because you can see it, how it uh, works. But in the future, if you look at the visions, we might have to add their label, say here you deal with a robot and here not. Like we have that also when you don't see it, when you, like with a, with a, um, a chatbot or something, where you also have to indicate um, here this is a, um, a, a chatbot and here this is a human person. So we need to probably get there in order to avoid some reaction and some, yeah, that the people are even maybe, I don't know, um, Uh, rebel against the robots and start, I mean, uh, um, we have that too. I mean, some people are really upset about it and start then yelling at the robot. 
surely something that they would not do or most of the people would not do against the waiter um, or waitress in a restaurant. But they would do that maybe to a robot because they think it doesn't have a soul. Right? So there's a lot of interesting elements. I mean, yeah, so um, being more um, all-purpose, being more humanoid, like this a bit of sci-fi vision also, um, might be not the way to go, at least not in the next 10, 20 years. We rather look in for certain purposes um, mm -hmm. that is um, there and then find the right um, purpose for uh, the right robot pur purpose. Yeah. Sounds, sounds exciting. One thing, though, I yeah. think also a normal reaction is to, yeah. to this topic and also to envisioning a future with robots, I think is fear. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps there are different sources for that and why people are fearful of the development, at least yeah, yeah. some are. Sure. Do you think this fear in some way is justified? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it is... Um, um, It depends also on what type of fear. Is it fear because I'm not treated well? Is it fear because I might be replaced um, by it? Um, and we see that quite a bit. And um, um, think about the situation in an in a, in a elderly care center. Yeah? And um, we have been working with them, getting also nurses uh, together with patients and, and doctors. Um, and there is a fear of being replaced And I think um, it is, um, in that sense, it is justified because there will be um, certain jobs will maybe exist less, like putting away the, the plates at restaurant. Maybe that is done by a robot or, or the same as bringing certain maybe medicine at a, in, in an elderly care center. But that also allows you to focus on other tasks that you might actually want to do more. So we need to think, and, and honestly, I think um, if you think about automatization in general, a good nurse um, is so much, uh, so important with the empathy, and that is something that you will not replace. So we might have to see that we focus on the things that we're actually the best in, not bringing another, let's say, new bed or something like that, but actually the human side is so strong in empathy, in being flexible to situations, um, connecting with people. So I, that's why I'm not, f I understand the fear, but I'm actually not worried about it. We have been adapting over years and years uh, of, uh, of generations uh, a lot. Also with our jobs, there were very different jobs. I mean, uh, um, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and we have been adapting to it. I mean, if you think about this um, a computer, And the computer's entire archive. I mean, in the 60s and 70s, what we had is there, we had a number of people, managers, and then we had hundreds of people that actually were only typing the things and putting it into an archive. This entire thing, made with speech recognition of hundreds of people, you have in this one computer, and we have adapted. So I am not particularly worried per se if we manage that well and give the people the chance to adapt and find them... Um, um, the things that they are really good in and, and much better. And maybe everybody has his own um, or her own robot that actually helps them in their nurse task, in their um, service task, whatever there is. Maybe I have a robot as a, as a, as a professor that helps me with some other things. I mean, uh, so that might be something for the future. Great take uh, on that. I don't want to take it too far. However, mm. there are those, I think, scenarios in movies sometimes where mm. robots, I mean start out as being helpful to humankind, but then at some point yeah. there's this flipping point. And one other example I would also like to add is, I don't know if you heard about it, but GPT-3 yeah. is from OpenAI, this yeah. new natural yeah, language yeah. processing <laughs> model, where you can, uh, online there's many videos out there also with actually emulated faces, so mm. an AI talking, where you can type in prompts, you can have a conversation, and yeah. you speak with this algorithm, GPT-3, which yeah. is kind of uh, a model for, for machine learning, and it responds crazily accurate and also it seems at least empathetic in some sense. You know, yeah. it, we yeah. don't know what really is there, if there is emotion or not, but we see those crazy developments. And mm -hmm. now my question, which I hope is not too far-fetched, but mm -hmm. do you see a scenario where also robotics or robots can turn against humankind in, in some form? Um, and it's a good example, <laughs> GPT-3, because we actually also use the uh, GPT-3 interface for our robot that we have here, and we let them interact on an open day with students. And uh, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, um, so um, we replaced the, 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 the interface with that, and then 
And surprisingly, the people that interacted, they complained because they found that actually quite rude. And, uh, um, so there's a lot of, I mean, uh, interesting, and um, we still have to figure out why that exactly like that. Um, but of course, it depends also on the train training data. I mean, on what was it trained, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think that is a part of the solution. I mean, uh, so are we? Is it a? Uh, um, uh, what is our way? Is it uh, the wonderful way that we are? Um, can avoid almost all work and have the robots working for us, or are we uh, slaves of the robots? Um, um, so uh, I think, obviously, I hope it's in between. Um, will the robots take over? I personally um, don't think so. Um, and it might be at least uh, some way to go. I mean, uh, um, so it might be a <laughs> way then, uh, then I maybe uh, uh, at least in my lifetime, maybe not. Um, but I think on a more short-term perspective on a, uh, we need to understand what is um, in particular the underlying technologies I mean uh, the robot itself can be sometimes just an empty shell but the underlying technology that you is there um, to what extent um, does it develop its own conscious to what extent are we accepting it as an own conscious we do that already with certain technologies with this um, uh, um, vector that is a robot a companion robot that people associate have more love to than maybe their relatives so we do have develop already a relationship to technology we do have that already um, so I think there is a, um, a way of um, importance of it um, we do need to educate people. We do need to, to some extent, even regulate it, look for biases. And it a lot has to do on what purpose and for what data we use um, to, to learn our robots world. I mean, and that is a, where we actually have to be a bit even more careful than I think the pure robots, how they work with their haptics, what they use with their um, faces. That's not so important. But the underlying, um, on what do we train it on? If somebody trains it with bad intention, and uses wrong data, uh, unethical, um, biased data, this is a problem. So this input we have to somehow also at least make transparent and make um, um, as open as possible so people can actually um, understand it. And um, I think that's the basis for it, the transparency of it and, and will not go without regulation, that's for sure. You know. So if we accept that developing this technology responsibly should be one of our prime objectives to follow, what does the current state look like out there? Do we have regulation in place? Are there certain things we try to do to make sure that we safely develop this? Um, there's no robot uh, uh, regulation. I think there's quite something of um, robot makers of self um, or industry um, norms and then the and agendas and which they, and, and, and re uh, rules to which they basically commit themselves to. So, and that is good like that because a regulator might be not fast enough, I mean, uh, to that. At the same time, for the different elements, I mean, on, uh, think about the GBT, uh, G, uh, GDP3, uh, G, GDPR, um, so the, the privacy regulations, um, but there are also other ones on um, um, how to audit, let's say, AI-based systems. So there are fragmented elements there. And um, so I think something is happening there. But we are in the early stage, and I have to admit, I would love to, and I want to believe also in the in the good of the people, um, to avoid too much regulation, which kills maybe some of the innovation in it. I think the only thing that we should do is, and that's what we, I think, also do here in Maastricht, is let's expose the people and the, the, um, the all old ones, young ones, to the technology and let them experience it and, and deal with it. And this knowledge is honestly the best base for making informed decisions. And then regulations will follow later, I think, good way. But we need to create this knowledge. We cannot just talk about it, let people interact with robots, let in a, in, a, in a safe environment. Then we actually develop um, knowledge, expertise, and also understand when is it useful, and then when is it not useful. And that's, without any doubt, both the case. And then we find hopefully the right use cases to address certain problems of the world on, on labor shortage, on um, uh, uh, jobs which are uh, maybe very dangerous, etc. And that's uh, my, my vision and my hope for it. And that's also why we work here, I think, on the robotics and exposing the world to it and seeing where is it good and where not. Dominic, 
I have one closing question for you. And perhaps your answer will be a bit biased <laughs> because of your work, <laughs> um, but still. Um, what, and in brackets, technological development are you most excited about for the future? Um, so the natural answer would be robotics, probably. <laughs> um, um, I have to admit, I'm, and I'm, I'm coming to the robotics, as um, you mentioned before, human digitalization. I am actually not about one particular. I'm quite in too interested in in uh, AR, VR, um, the, the the voice assistants, um, robotics, etc. Um, but as you mentioned before. And so to some extent, it's a combination out of different things. Um, I am very excited about what is going to happen with the metaverse, um, which links it all um, and takes it one step further. And it might be not the vision that um, um, only Mark Zuckerberg has. I mean, uh, and there are competing visions also of Google on a little bit of different um, way how to integrate, how to merge the digital and the physical world. I am very interested in, in how that actually pans out and seeing almost the battle of the giants. I mean, the Apples and the Microsoft, etc., all of the world. How is it going? And not to forget, of course, uh, a lot of Chinese companies, a lot of um, uh, great startups, a lot of uh, uh, European companies also. So I'm interested into what is this, what we sometimes call synthetic experience. In which way is that going to work out? Is it more extremely the VR perspective, almost the Mark Zuckerberg, the meta perspective? Or is it uh, maybe more of an... IoT enhanced, uh, let's say, um, Google, where Google puts itself everywhere, um, perspective. I'm excited how that works out, this synthetic experience. So that's a big, bigger topic, I know, but it's not one technology, but I'm interested about how the technology is used by people then. And that's um, my main interest, and it will definitely be there for the next years to come. Yeah. With all those questions and even uncertainties, I think uh, uh, one thing is certain, we're going to experience change. Yes, yes, yes. That, <laughs> so, uh, absolutely. Uh, That's for sure. Uh -huh. You're right. Uh, yeah. Well, Dominic, with this in mind, and also I think some nice closing thoughts from, from your side, um, I would like to thank you again for joining this episode of the SBE podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're pleasure. glad you made it. Um, yeah. For the people watching and also listening, um, I'm excited to welcome you back for another episode yeah. very soon, either on Spotify, um, Apple Podcast, or YouTube. And yeah, uh, if you have any also feedback, questions, and concerns, feel free to share them also via Instagram or also down in the comments. And yeah, with this, Dominic, again, thank you so much. And yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thanks. <laughs>